Hello, thank you for joining us. I am here with Jacob and Jed, and from today we're going to be reading the Protagoras. Now, actually, we did jump into it a little bit last week at the end of reading the Theotetus. So for those of you who did not see that video, I'm going to paste 20 minutes or so from the previous week here. For those of you who did see that video, I'm going to um, pin uh, in the comment section a timestamp that you can jump to to get to today's conversation. Okay, so for those of you who want to just uh, to either have a refresher or to see for the first time, the first 20 minutes or so, the introduction there, um, just keep watching. And then for the rest of you, please check the comments section and you can jump ahead. So we met Protagoras, or at least we heard a lot about him in the Theotetus. And so I thought it might be interesting to actually see how Socrates deals with an actual sophist. And so that's what is going on here in the Protagoras. So we have about 20 minutes or so, so maybe we can at least get a little bit into it, get the introduction and see what's going on. Okay. Um, for those of you watching this on YouTube, I will be putting a link in the description box. Um, if you followed us on our dial on our reading together with, of the Mino, you may already have this PDF because it is the same edition of the Lobe. Okay, so now we're all set up, ready to look at the introduction of the Protagoras. So it opens with Socrates talking to a friend. And the person has no name, just friend. <laughs> so, um, who would like to read the friend? And who would like to read Socrates? Jed, pick a roll. Huh. I, well, Jacob was Socrates last time, so... Mm -hmm. um, I'll, it's I'll only fair. Is, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, Jacob. All right. Sure. Okay. So we'll jump into it whenever you're ready. Where have you been now, Socrates? Ah, uh, but of course, you have been in chase of Alcibiades and his youthful beauty. Well, only the other day, as I looked at him, I thought him still handsome as a man, for a man he is, Socrates, between you and me, and with quite a growth of beard. And what of that? Do you mean to say that you do not approve of Homer, who said that youth has highest grace in him, whose beard is appearing, as now in the case of Alcibiades? Then how is the affair at present? Have you been with him just now? And how is the young man treating you? Quite well. I considered, and especially uh, so today, for he spoke a good deal on my side, supporting me in a discussion. In fact, I have only just left him. However, there is a strange thing I have to tell you. Although he was present, I not merely paid him no attention, but at times forgot him altogether. Why? And can... Uh, sorry, why? What can have happened between you and him? Something serious? For surely you did not find anyone else of greater beauty there. No, not in our city. Yes, of far greater. What do you say? One of our people or a foreigner? A foreigner. Of what city? Abderia. And you found this foreigner so beautiful that he appeared to you of greater beauty than the son of Selenius? Why, my good sir, must not the wisest appear more beautiful? Do you mean it was some wise man that you met just now? Nay, rather, the wisest of our generation. I may tell you if wisest is what you agree to call Protagoras. 
Ah, uh, what a piece of news. Protagoras come to town. Yes. Two days ago. And it was his company that you left just now? Yes. And a great deal I said to him, and he to me. Then do let us hear your account of the conversation at once. If you are disengaged, take my boy's place and sit here. Very good. All right, get out of the way, you little kid. Oh, <laughs> there we go. Indeed. I shall be obliged to you if you will listen. Okay, I'm going to pause there for a moment. Um, so we see a few things here. First of all, um, oh, Alcibiades is mentioned here again. But we see that, as, of, as we've seen in other dialogues as well, maybe um, other people would like to imagine, and even Alcibiades would like to imagine a romance striking up between him and um and Socrates, but that's not Socrates' interest. And he says here that the wisest is more beautiful than the physically beautiful. Also notice in his introduction to Protagoras, it's a bit tongue-in-cheek, right? Oh, wait. He's the wisest if wisest is what you agree to call Protagoras. What do you think of that introduction to Protagoras? Any thoughts? Yeah, that's how sophists describe themselves mm -hmm. as being very wise mm -hmm. so that people will pay them. Mm -hmm. Does it seem like Socrates agrees that he's the wisest? No. <laughs> no. So we already have some sense of where it's going, right? So we're going to be seeing Socrates um, tangling it up with a, with a sophist, and he's going to be showing us how to talk to a sophist. And another thing we see here is that the friend wants an account of the conversation. So this is something that's happened many times. This is the way many of Plato's dialogues are structured, right? The whole thing is somebody's account of a previous discussion. Um, the case of the symposium, it was many years earlier. And um, we were getting the account many, many years later. Um, in this case, it was the same day. He just came from this conversation. And it's all quite fresh in his mind. And we've also seen that... Um, how well a person remembers says something about their level or skill with philosophy. The Theotetus also is a flashback. And that one, remember, was all written down. And there's some, you know, poor slave boy reading the whole thing. <laughs> and um, was it Terpsion, was it, who written it, wrote it down? I forget. Um, but anyway, the character who wrote it down he showed it to Socrates many times and made changes to it. As I think also Apollodorus may have done, I don't remember, in, in the symposium. Or he learned it from someone else and wrote it all down and memorized it. In the case of um, the Theotetus, it was not memorized, but it was all written down. Here we have Socrates just relaying it off the top of his head. Right, he had just come from the conversation. So we have another one of those cases of the whole thing being an account of an earlier conversation. Is there a significance that there mm -hmm. it's the same day this time when usually it's the day before or a long time ago? Not necessarily, but that's a question to hold on to that you can maybe look out for. Okay, and so then from here, it goes into then, it's more of like his narrative. And so we don't have that clear-cut um, friend, and then here's the line, and Socrates, and here's the line. So we're going to have to be a little more, this one, it's, we saw this before with the symposium as well. We have to um, turn it into such a dialogue. 
So let's see, we have, yeah, I still have about 15 minutes. So I want to go a little bit more into this. Um, we're still in the introduction. He has, we're not going to meet Protagoras just yet. So now he's going to meet somebody named Hippocrates, who is very excited about Protagoras being in town. So, um, Jed, if you can continue as Socrates, and maybe uh, Jed can pick up Hippocrates, and then wherever there's some um, narrative that's not any speaker, I'll jump in. Okay. 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 Um, so, okay, so I'll take up this first line here. The friend says, and we also to you, I assure you, if you will tell us. And then Socrates picks up here. Mm -hmm. Yes, friend, good friend. Um, a twofold obligation. Well, now, listen. During this night just past, in the small hours, Hippocrates, son of Apollodorus and brother of Phaeson, knocked violently at my door with his stick. And when they opened to him, he came hurrying in at once and calling to me in a loud voice, Socrates, are you awake or sleeping? Then I, recognizing his voice, said, Hippocrates, hello. Some news to break to me? Only good news, he replied. Tell it. And welcome, I said. What is it? And what business brings you here at such an hour? Protagoras has come, he said, standing at my side. Yes, two days ago, I said. Have you only just heard? So maybe let's... um. Maybe if Jacob jumps in and reads oh, yeah. the lines <laughs> of Hippocrates, it will give us more of a sense of a dialogue. Sorry, my bad. Uh, I said, have you only yeah. just heard? Sorry, now I'm trying to find where we are. Um. Hippocrates, so, you come busting into my house at this time of the hour and you forget about what happened? Are you drunk, uh, sir? Yes, I haven't. <laughs> um, Last evening. Hmm. With Okay, yes, by heaven, last evening. With this, he groped about for the bedstead and sitting down by my feet, he said... It was in the evening, after I had got in very late from, oh no, oh no. <laughs> my, my boy, Satrius, you see, had run away. I meant to let you know I was going to chase, I was going in chase of him, but some other matter put it out of my head. On my return, when we had finished dinner and were about to retire, my brother told me, only then, that Protagoras had come. I made an effort, even at that hour, to get to you at once, but came to the conclusion that it was too late at night. But as soon as I had slept off my fatigue, I had got up at once and made my way straight here. Then I, noting the man's gallant sprint and the flutter oh maybe that isn't a uh, text that he said oh sorry then i noting the man's gallant spirit and the flutter he was in remarked well what is that to you has protagoras wronged you at this he laughed yes by the gods by being the only wise man, and not making me one. But by Zeus, if you give him a fee and win him over, he will make you wise too. Would to Zeus and all the gods... Wait, oh, sorry. he make you wise too. <laughs> would, would to Zeus and all the gods... Only that were needed. I should not spare either my own pocket or those of my friends. But it is on this very account I have come to you now, to see if you will have a talk with him on my behalf. For one thing, 
I am too young to do it myself. And for another, I have never yet seen Protagoras nor heard him speak a word. I was but a child when he paid us his previous visit. You know, Socrates, how everyone praises the man and tells of his mastery of speech. Let us step over to him at once to make sure of finding him in. He is staying, so I was told, with Callias, son of Hipponicus. Now let us be going. We had better not go there yet, my good friend. It is so very early. Let us rise and turn into the court here, and spend the time strolling here until daylight comes. And after that, we can go. Protagoras, you see, spends most of his time indoors. So have no fear. We shall find him in all right. We'll find him in all right, most likely. So then we got up and strolled in the court. And I wanting to test Hippocrates' grit, began examining him with a few questions. Tell me, Hippocrates, in your present design of going to Protagoras and paying him money as a fee for his services to yourself, to whom do you consider you are resorting? And what is it that you are to become? Suppose, for example, you had taken it into your head to call on your namesake, Hippocrates of Kos, the Asclepiad, and pay him money as your personal fee. And suppose somebody asked you, tell me, Hippocrates, in proposing to pay a fee to Hippocrates, what do you consider him to be? How would you answer that? A doctor. And what would you intend to become? A doctor. And suppose you had a mind to approach Polycletus, the Argive, or Phidias, the Athenian, and pay them a personal fee, and somebody asked you, what is it that you consider Polycletus or Phidias to be? That you are minded to pay them this money. What would your answer be to that? Sculptors. And what would you intend to become? Obviously a sculptor. Very well then. You and I will go now to Protagoras, prepared to pay him money as your fee. From our own means, if they are adequate, for the purpose of prevailing on him. But if not, then uh, drawing on our friend's resources to make up the sum. Now... If anyone, observing our extreme earnestness in this matter, should ask us, pray, Socrates and Hippocrates, what is it that you take Protagoras to be when you propose to pay him money? What should we reply to him? What is the name, what is the other name that we commonly hear attached to Protagoras? They call Phidias a sculptor and Homer a poet. What title do they give Protagoras? A sophist, to be sure, Socrates, is what they call him. Then we go to him and pay him the money as a sophist. Certainly. Now, suppose somebody asked you this further question. And what is it that you yourself hope to become when you go to Protagoras? To this he replied with a blush, for by then there was a glimmer of daylight by which I could see him quite clearly. If it is like the previous cases, obviously to become a sophist. In heaven's name, would you not be ashamed to present yourself before the Greeks as a sophist? Yes, on my soul I should, Socrates, if I am to speak my real thoughts. Yet, after all, Hippocrates, perhaps it is not this sort of learning that you expect to get from Protagoras, but rather the sort you had from your language master and your harp teacher and your sports instructor. When they took your lessons from each of these, when you took your lessons from each of these, it was not in the technical way 
with the view of to become a professional, but for education as befits a private gentleman. I quite agree. It is rather this kind of learning that one gets from Protagoras. Then you are aware what you are now about to do. Or is it not clear to you? To what do you refer? I mean your intention of submitting your soul to the treatment of a man who, as you say, is a sophist. And as to what a sophist really is, I shall be surprised if you can tell me. And yet, if you are ignorant of this, you cannot know to whom you are entrusting your soul, whether it is to something good or to something evil. I really think that I know. Oh, but, uh, but then tell me, please, what do you consider a sophist to be? I should say, from what the name implies, that he is one who has knowledge of wise matters. Well, we are able to say this of painters, also, and of carpenters, that they are persons who have knowledge of wise matters, and if someone asked us for what those matters are wise, of which painters have knowledge, I suppose we should tell him that they are wise for the production of likeness, and similarly for the rest. But if we should ask for what the matters are of the sophist, that makes them wise, for what the matters of the sophist are wise, how should we answer him? What sort of workmanship is he the master of? How should we describe him, Socrates? As a master of making one a clever speaker? Okay, let's pause there. Um, we're out of time, but there's quite a bit going on here, right? So Socrates says he wants to test Hippocrates. So Hippocrates is very excited. Oh, Protagoras is in town. He's the wisest of the sophists. Oh, but I don't want to be a sophist. So there's something shameful about being called a sophist, but somehow this guy is great because he's a sophist. So that doesn't really make sense. And he doesn't know what a sophist is, and yet he wants to trust his soul to a sophist. He's willing to pay all the money he has and even, you know, mooch off his friends to get them to pay for it. And he doesn't know what it is. And so here we see Socrates then is going to test him, and Socrates is going to go along with him to meet Protagoras and have a little discussion with him. So this is a really fun dialogue, um, and I hope that we can have some fun with it and seeing how Socrates messes with this guy. Um, any thoughts, though, at this point? I'm glad that we went through a period of reflection of the discussion we just had a moment ago. Hmm. Similarly, I think they're going through a period of reflection of a discussion they had a few moments ago. Mm -hmm. I'm glad we did the same because mm. so many of the ideas that we talked about, I'm seeing glowing, <laughs> shining through like a blushing Hippocrates mm -hmm. um, in this opening introduction too. Mm -hmm. Similar questions being asked, yeah. similar ideas about the similar things. It's amazing. It comes up again and again. This word wisdom just keeps getting thrown around in knowledge. Right opinion. All these terms get thrown around without being defined. <laughs> wow, interesting. It's like a, it's like an opening gambit. Like um, you could throw out. I guess maybe wisdom is of the sort that you could throw it out and see where the person lands relative to wisdom. Mm -hmm. Are we going to be talking about knowledge with Theotetus? Are we going to be talking about? being a sophist with Protagoras, mm -hmm. what's your idea of wisdom? Mm -hmm. how, how high up the ladder do you go, which you, might inform how we talk? And you can guess that Socrates's notion of what wisdom is, is probably not the same as Protagoras's. Right. And yet he can still use the word to mm -hmm. engage with his fellow human beings in a way that would, I'm supposing, ben benefit them. At mm -hmm. least it did with Theotetus. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's really, mm -hmm. it's really like a, a testament to, mm -hmm. even though 
even though the ideas that we read here and we gain from these read-alongs with Mindy, um, they might be high words, but it's worth using them because it kind of applies to everyone based on where they're at. We shouldn't mm -hmm. feign away from being like Socrates in the use of these high words mm -hmm. like wisdom because... Right. We understand them where we're at, but also by thinking about these dialogues and by taking on the challenges of each dialogue, we're purifying ourselves of whatever errors we're making in how we understand these words. We're refining our own understanding of what knowledge is, what wisdom is. He doesn't just say, this is it. And he's, he made it very clear that you can't just give a definition of knowledge and now you know what it is because that's not what it means to know. That's not what episteme is. But we're going through this purification process with each dialogue, getting a better sense. It's coming clear into focus. Right? And that's why we want to hold our questions right? and just explore. Hold our questions. Mm. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt. Yes. Hold our questions and, and use these words that we're, that we're using in our... Mm -hmm in our lives and with right. our friends. Use them as best we can, but be open to keep refining our understanding of what they are. Absolutely. Mm. Okay. Very human task. Okay. Now we can get into today's reading and I'm going to do just a very quick review for those of you who did skip ahead. And then for those of you who watched, here's just some quick points highlighting some of the key things that we talked about. So we saw back on page 99, which was, let me get the correct um, Stephanus number, that's the 311 AB. And here we see that Socrates wanted to test Hippocrates' grit. So remember here now, Hippocrates was very excited because um, Parmenides is in town. I'm sorry, not Parmenides. <laughs> Protagoras is in town. And he wants to give all his money to Protagoras and be educated by him. And somehow it's going to make him better, but he doesn't really know how it's going to happen. So he wants Socrates to talk to Protagoras and um, test if this guy's any good or whatever. So Socrates is certainly willing to do so, but first he wants to talk a little bit to, Hipp to Hippocrates alone, just to, you know, get a sense of where Hippocrates is coming from. And so he wants to test him. And then just one other thing I want to point out here is that Socrates says to him, you're submitting your soul to the treatment of a man who, as you say, is a sophist. Do you even know what that means? You're, you're testing, you you want to give this person money? Do you even know what you're going to get for that money? And that's where the conversation ended last week. So I marked here in blue where we ended off. This is where we want to start today. So he was asking, what kind of knowledge will you gain from a sophist? If you were to um, go to a painter, you would learn how to paint. Uh, what sort of workmanship is he master of? And Hippocrates said, how should we describe him, Socrates, as a master of making one a clever speaker? And then Socrates right. said. Mm. Right. Perhaps a clever speaker. Um, perhaps we should be speaking the truth, but yet not all the truth. For our answer still calls for a question as to the subject on which the sophist makes one a clever speaker. Just as the harp player makes one clever, I presume, at speaking on the matter of which he gives one knowledge, namely harp playing. Do you agree to that? Hippocrates? Oh, well... About what does the sophist make oh, one a yes. clever? Yes, sorry, your answer is yes. Harp player, yes, makes one mm -hmm. able to speak on harp playing. Mm. Yes. Well, okay. About what does the sophist make one a clever speaker? 
Clearly, it must be the same thing as that of which he gives one knowledge. So it would seem. Now, what is this thing of which the sophist himself has knowledge and gives knowledge to his pupil? Ah, there, in good faith, I fail to find you an answer. Now tell me, are you aware upon what sort of hazard you are going to stake your soul? If you had to entrust your body to someone, taking the risk of it being made better or worse, you would first consider most carefully whether you ought to entrust it or not and would seek the advice of your friends and relations, and ponder it for a number of days. But in the case of your soul, which you value much more highly than your body, and on which depends the good or ill condition of all your affairs, according as it is made better or worse, would you omit to consult first with either your father or your brother, or one of us, your comrades, as to whether or not you should entrust your very soul to this newly arrived foreigner. But choose rather, having heard of him in the evening, as you say, and coming to me at dawn, to make no mention of this question, and take no counsel upon it, whether you ought to entrust yourself to him or not. And are you ready to spend your own substance at and that of your friends in the settled conviction that at all costs you must converse with Protagoras, whom you neither know, as you tell me, nor have ever met in argument before, and whom you call a sophist, in patent ignorance of what this sophist may be to whom you are about to entrust yourself. It seems so, Socrates, by what you say. Then can it be, Hippocrates, that the sophist is really a sort of merchant or dealer in provisions on which a soul is nourished? For such is the view I take of him. So notice there, that Socrates is comparing the sophist to a merchant. So he's not calling sophistry an art. What is the significance of that? Maybe that an art is something that you create yourself, but a merchant sells art from other people so okay. it's not like directly yeah. from him maybe yeah and who benefits from an art for socrates and for plato a key point about art is who benefits the artist or the object like he often will use a doctor as an example the doctor doesn't benefit from healing you if you're the patient. It's the patient who benefits. So the doctor may charge money so that the doctor gets something out of it, but the, the doctor's art purely by itself is um, only for the benefit of others. How about for the merchant? Is the same true? No, then it's like reciprocal. You hope. Give and take. <laughs> That's, you get yeah. <laughs> right, or or you just get taken from yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the merchant is doing it for him or herself, right? And if you benefit, maybe that makes the merchant. Uh, maybe the merchant can sell more. Hopefully, the product is good, so more people will buy it. But it's for the merchant, right? It would be strange so if you went into the store and, mm. and the merchant said to you, uh, it's Jacob, I think you've had your fair share of sugar today. No candy bar for you. We wouldn't That's be right. So they don't care if it's really healthy for you or not. If it tastes good and they can sell a lot of it, they consider it a good product. Right? It doesn't matter if it's actually good for you or not. 
That's a good point. And we'll see going forward then how he uses this idea of a merchant or comparing this office, I should say, to a merchant. If then the idea of art uh, involves benefiting the person, the other person, mm -hmm. would mm -hmm. it therefore have to have some sort of idea of the ideal to which you are trying to bring the person you're benefiting? Well, if you're acting from a place of knowledge, but if it's, it's possible to, um, that you're, as an artist, you only have right opinion. So there would be a lesser artist, but it would still, like this, like philosophy is in art. Um, how good you are at it um, as a philosopher might, you know, depend on whether you have knowledge or only right opinion. But philosophy itself is an art and it's a knowledge. Right. So for it to be an art, we need to mm -hmm. both be benefiting and have mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. ideal involved. And yes. depending on whether it's knowledge or right opinion, the person mm -hmm. giving the art has to have some awareness of that ideal to which they're moving. Correct. Yeah. That idea of the difference between an art and that which is not an art is covered a lot in the Gorgias that we were talking about before we started recording. Um, so that's a good one to look at to see that difference. But he's not actually talking about art here. I just threw that in because he compared the sophist to a merchant. And so we want to see what he's going to do with that. And I think that your comment about the, the chocolate and the sugar, it was a, maybe a good setup for where it's going. So with that in mind, um, let's see Hippocrates' response. With what, Socrates, is a soul nourished? With doctrines, presumably. And we must take care, my good friend, that the sophist, in commending his wares, does not deceive us, as both merchant and dealer do in... An so, as both merchant and dealer do in the case of our bodily food. For among the provisions, you know, in which these men deal, not only are they themselves ignorant of what is good or bad for the body, since in selling they commend them to all, but the people who buy from them are so too, unless one happens to be a trainer or a doctor. And in the same way, those who take their doctrines, the round of our cities, hawking them about to any odd purchaser who desires them, commend everything that they sell. And there may well be some of these too, my good sir, who are ignorant which of their wares is good or bad for the soul. And in just the same case, are the people who buy from them, unless one happens to have a doctor's knowledge here also, but of the soul. So then, if you are well informed as to what is good or bad among these wares, it will be safe for you to buy doctrines from Protagoras or from anyone else you please. But if not, take care, my dear fellow, that you do not risk your great treasure on a toss of the dice. For I tell you, there is far more serious risk in the purchase of doctrines than in that of eatables. When you buy victuals and liquors, you can carry them off from the dealer or merchant in your separate vessels, and before you take them into your body by drinking or eating, you can lay them by in your house and take the advice of an expert whom you can call in as to what is fit to eat or drink and what is not, and how much you should take and when, so that in this purchase the risk is not serious, but you cannot carry away doctrines in a separate vessel. You are compelled, when you have handed over the price, to take the doctrine into your very soul by learning it, and so to depart either an injured, you will depart either an injured or benefited man. These, then, are questions which we have to consider 
with the aid of our elders, since we ourselves are still rather young to unravel so great a matter. For the moment, however, let us pursue our design and go and hear this person. And when we have heard him, we shall proceed to consult others, for Protagoras is not the only one there. We shall find Hippus of Elis, and, I believe, Prodicus of Sios, and numerous other men of wisdom besides. Okay, thank you both for the reading. So that's the end of that introduction. From here, we're going to have the setup of where they actually get to the house. Before we go on, though, I would like to get um, a little of your feedback here. Um, first, let's go back here. So he has a warning, then, for Hippocrates, that you have to be careful what you take into your soul. It's your greatest treasure. You don't want to just uh, gamble it away on a toss of the dice. What do you think of Socrates' speech here? Jacob, what were your thoughts as we went through this? Right, so knowledge can be, you know, good or bad. People can develop beliefs which can help them or hurt them in their life based on what they believe. So, yeah, if you buy, if you buy the wrong doctrines, um, you can, you know, essentially corrupt, you know, your soul, mm -hmm. which, you know, if you're, you eat something bad, it's gonna affect you right away. But if you can like learn something bad, it might be harder to tell mm. whether it's, it you know, yeah. how it's affected you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. It may affect you in ways that you don't even realize. Right. It seems harmless, but it's not. Mm. Yeah. Anything you wanted to add, Jed? I like the idea of laying out your wares and not being able to do that mm. with your doctrines or beliefs or opinions you get mm -hmm. from others. Mm. Because quite often you don't even know that they're there. Mm -hmm. And it takes someone with an art, like the last text we read with Socrates and um, Theotetus, mm. to, oh, to draw... Mm -hmm. Sorry? Meaning where he talked about being a midwife? That yes. It takes that skill or art to draw out those doctrines you have within you that you might not even know you're carrying around with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, now there's um, an interesting part here, this idea of laying out your wares, as you're saying. He said that when you're dealing with doctrines, you are compelled to learn them. Why are you compelled? What is he saying here? Jacob, did you pick up on this? Um, may, I, maybe I didn't pick up on it uh, too much. I, I'm sure it's that if you, if it's like a food, you could just try it or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if, if it's a doctrine, you, you need to understand mm -hmm. the full thing to... You can't just learn like the first couple words of a doctrine and pretend you know it. You have to maybe know the whole thing before you judge yeah. whether it's right or wrong. Mm. What do you make of this phrase right here? When you've handed over the price. Does it mean like you're committed to learning it? You've handed over your soul exactly. kind of? Yeah, maybe you haven't handed over your soul, but you put money on it. And have you noticed that when people pay for something, they don't want to admit that it was no good? Yes, <laughs> definitely. I remember years ago, um, before LASIK surgery, and this is going way back, like when I was a university student, before LASIK surgery became commonplace, there was something something before that where they would actually like cut your pupil in certain places to fix your eyesight. Um, but it was a, a very controversial method. And um, 
very scary because like if it doesn't work it's like you can't wear contacts anymore and so I remember uh, one of my friends got that surgery it was called RK I forget what it stands for but the letters were RK and um, she got that surgery and then I saw her this was like after we graduated and I went to visit her like a year after we graduated after she had the surgery and she told me how great it is oh it's so wonderful you've got to do it I was I used to wear glasses I did have LASIK but um, when my daughter was a baby, she was always grabbing at my glasses and I thought it's a good time to do that. But I used to wear contacts and I had glasses back when I was a university student. And my friend is telling me, oh, you've got to get the surgery. It's so great. But then like as we went on with our conversation and then I saw I stayed with her for like a week. And as we went on, I found out that like she had all kinds of problems and she had to go back and get touch-ups. Oh, but it's great. You should get it. But then she still has certain times when she has to wear glasses because there are like, it's different when you're like looking up close and reading a book versus far away. Oh, but it's great. You should get the surgery. She can't, um, she has to wear glasses at night because she has this like night blindness where like lights are like very bright like I guess you can see like an aura around the lights and they get too big or something and oh but it's great you got to get the surgery and it just went on and on and there's so many problems with it and I felt really bad for her you know that she did this but um like once you commit to something you don't want to admit if it wasn't so great or you want to convince yourself that it was great and you can also hear this um with different kinds of teachings. Um, we might want to compare Protagoras, maybe in a modern context, to like a self-help guru or a motivational speaker type person. Um, and if you pay a lot of money for a self-help course, you really want to believe you're getting something good for it. So once you put the money down, you've made some kind of commitment. I, maybe if you're very rich, it's less of a commitment, but certainly for middle class and poor people, and like what Hippocrates is talking about here, is he's like going to pay everything he has, and maybe he has to borrow from his friends, so it's like everything. When you p pay that much money, it's really hard to just walk away from it. Right, so... So that's, I think, what Socrates is pointing out here. You're compelled when you hand over the money to take the doctrine in your very soul by learning it. Yeah, it reminds me of like, you know, they call it the sunken cost fallacy. Mm -hmm. Once you've put some money in there, it's hard to stop. Right, right. Say, so I'm already in it. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Then it, it changes your calculations. Like, well, I've already invested this much time and money. University also, very expensive. Hugely, I mean, the levels of debt that people coming out of university now have is just astronomical. It's, I mean, I thought I had a lot of debt coming out of university, but it's nothing compared to what younger people have, like millennials and Gen Zs have. It's amazing. And so when you've put out that much money, it's really hard to walk away from it. Although actually, um, if you are like a wealthy person whose parents paid for your university, you might actually have the luxury of not caring what you're learning in university. But if you're taking out those loans or you're working to put yourself through school or you worked for a while and you're going back to school, you're going to be more invested in what you're learning, which is generally seen as a positive thing, right? That you care more, like university is wasted on the young because we don't really value it. We all look back and think, oh, I wish I had studied more when I was a student or I wish I had cared. And, there were so many interesting things I could have done, or now that I know what I want to do with my life, I would choose different classes or a different major. And so there are many positive sides to this idea that when you're older or if you're paying for it yourself, you're going to be more committed. But when you're choosing something that really affects your soul, 
like what Protagoras teaches, as Socrates is pointing out here, there is actually a danger to that level of commitment. Jed, what are you thinking as you're hearing this? Yeah, no, I see that a lot. A lot of those like self-help mm -hmm. people and um, yeah, they they start by making you make making you pay first to get you invested, and then once you have this belief, one of the things that kind of um, validates for you the significance of the belief is if others believe it too. So then you have these soldiers running around trying to convert everybody to your religion, mm -hmm. to their right. religion. Yeah, right. That's the good point because other people who are students of the same sophists, for example, they also have committed themselves and they don't want to admit that it's no good. And so like everybody's telling everyone else that I'm benefiting. And then you think, oh, well, everyone else is benefiting. Maybe it's just me. And it's probably nobody's benefiting. <laughs> or maybe they are benefiting, but it's not at the level. Like I'm sure there's a lot of um, self-help gurus out there who are benefiting people. But when you put that person next to a Socrates, for example, you're going to see a huge gap. And so that's another danger is that people think that I am getting some benefit, therefore it must be right. Whereas it may not be the most effective or the most efficient way. Just because you're benefiting doesn't mean it's the best. That's right. Like, um, mm -hmm. um, I think it's Jordan Peterson who said, well, if you can make your bed, and a lot of these young people are like, well, I couldn't make my bed last week, so so maybe this guy is onto it because I have made this slight increase in benefit, right. then maybe mm -hmm. all the other stuff are good, is good as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And right. it's, uh, it's a trick, like especially if you right. can set the criteria yourself. Like all you have to do yeah. is make your bed, and you know it's the, the teachings are good. Mm -hmm. That's a little good benefit. It's not, right. it's not the best. Right. right. And the person may have some good advice, but also some wrong things mixed in if they don't have the knowledge. Right. So they'll have, so maybe some of it is good, but then there's also some bad stuff mixed in. And if you benefit from the good, then you're going to trust the bad or the wrong, I should say. Right. And so you really need somebody like that to be able to discern with themselves. What is the knowledge and what is my own personal mm -hmm. things I'm dealing with? What's my own personal opinions or my problems right. or things? Because yes. it's very easy when you get into that position mm -hmm. of authority to mm -hmm. pass off what you think you know as something you know. Right. And that takes us back then to this quote here. If you are well informed as to what is good or bad among these wares, it will be safe for you to buy doctrines from Protagoras or from anyone else. But if not, then take care, because that's where you're going to run into the danger of not knowing when the advice is good and when it's not so good. Right. And what Socrates mm -hmm. was able to do with, um, mm -hmm. in our last mm -hmm. dialogue with... Um, mm -hmm. Uh, who was Socrates? Quite who was the teacher? Protagoras. Theodorus. Theodorus. Oh, Theodorus, and then his he was a student of Protagoras here. Yes. To be able to engage in the sort of line of mm -hmm. questioning that Socrates was with Theodorus was a good way mm -hmm. of being able to mm -hmm. lay out the wares and be able to judge whether or not mm -hmm. then they're, they're good or bad, knowledgeable, and so really speaks to how valuable that art of being able to have dialogue with people mm -hmm. is for that purpose. Mm -hmm. And right. that's not a yeah. skill that we normally learn. And also it's not an opportunity. Very rarely do you get to speak to dear leader in, in right. that sort of way. Mm. No. Yeah. So Socrates is very good at finding excuses, if you will, to start testing these teachers. So we saw that, in the last dialogue, the way he questioned Theodorus, because he went there saying, well, I just want to meet, meet one of your students. I heard you have a, a, a student who's really wise. I want, to, I want to meet your student. And that was like a way in the door. And then we see here as well, he has a way in the door because Hippocrates asked Socrates to go talk to Protagoras. And so 
that could be at least the surface story of how Socrates gets in there and says, oh, this I'm just here to talk to you about my friend here who really wants to pay you a lot of money. Are you willing to talk to me? And it's pretty hard for a merchant or dealer to say no to that. That's right. That's part of the art. Part mm -hmm. of the art is getting your foot in the door, like a, mm -hmm. like a good door-to-door mm -hmm. -door salesman would say. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's funny because he used the same technique when he was a, quite young with um, um, Parmenides, who you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. He said, mm -hmm. Parmenides, yeah. oh, let, let me question your student then. And Parmenides had to step in and go, well, actually, I better, I better tell you mm. my philosophy after mm. all. Right, Very right. sneaky, Sock. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, I forgot to mention this. I highlighted this part here and forgot to mention it. That he says that they're still rather young. So this is an early... So if you're looking at the dialogues in terms of chronology, this would be an early one. And in fact, when we get to the setup of the um, actual dialogue, once he reaches the house where Protagoras is staying, and that's, a, that's the next thing we're going to be reading, and we'll see in there, some of the people in the symposium are mentioned, but it's clear that this dialogue took place before that. So this is chronologically rather early in Socrates' adult life. It's interesting too what we mm -hmm. said about mm -hmm. these techniques mm -hmm. to be able to engage in dialogue, mm -hmm. reasoned reflection together through questions and answers to determine the mm -hmm. truth of something and the value or benefit of it. It's interesting that there are these techniques to get into the door for that, but similarly there are these techniques of convincing others when you are a sophist mm -hmm. like being able to charge money whereas socrates as you were saying so oh, my friend wants to give you money he's using a similar sort of idea but for mm -hmm. a completely different reason di different mm -hmm. goal oh yes. there's money on the line let us talk as opposed to mm -hmm. there's money on the line believe my doctrines mm. yeah he can out sophist the sophists and that's another thing that we're going to be looking at as we go on over the next few weeks, looking at this dialogue, is we're going to see the ways in which Socrates kind of sets him up and tests him, and we'll see the different tricks that Socrates uses. But first we have the setup, and this part I will read because it's not dialogue. And as I go through this, I want both of you to try to picture it. Like, imagine you're going to be directing a movie about this. And so you have to think about the setting and how you're going to set it up and how you're going to present it to the viewer. So try to really see it and see what's going on here. Okay. Okay, so he mentions again, just to, um, just to remember where we left off here, that it's not only Protagoras that is at this house, but also Hippias of Elis and Prodicus of Chaos who are two other sophists. <laughs> so he says, This we resolved on and set forth. And when we arrived at the doorway, we stood discussing some question or other that had occurred to us by the way. So not to leave it unfinished, but to get it settled before we went in, we stood there and discussed in front of the door until we had come to an agreement with each other. So that's already an interesting scene. But now I fancy the doorkeeper, who was a eunuch, overheard us. Very likely the great number of sophists has made him annoyed with callers at the house. At any rate, when we had knocked on the door, he opened it and on seeing us, Hello, he said, sophists there, masters engaged. So saying, he seized the door with both hands and very smartly clapped it, clapped it too with all his might. We tried knocking again, and then he spoke in answer through the closed door. Sirs, have you not heard? He is engaged. And then Socrates spoke. But, my good fellow, we have not come to see Callias, nor are we sophists. Have no fear, I tell you. We have come to ask if we may see Protagoras. So go and announce us. Sorry, I lost my spot there. I looked down for a moment. Um, 
Oh, okay. Sorry. Then with much hesitation, the fellow opened the door to us. And when we had entered, we came upon Protagoras as he was walking around in the cloister. And close behind him, two companies were walking round also. On the one side, Callias, son of Hipponicus, and his brother on his mother's side, Perilus, son of Pericles. And there was Charmides, son of Glaucon, while the other troop consisted of Pericles' other son, Xanthippus, Philippides, son of Philomelus, and Antimorus of Mende, who is the most highly reputed of Protagoras' disciples, and is taking the course professionally with a view to becoming a sophist. The persons who followed in their rear, listening to what they could of the talk, seemed to be mostly strangers, brought by the great Protagoras from the several cities which he traverses, enchanting them with his voice like Orpheus, while they followed where the voice sounds enchanted. And some of our own inhabitants were also dancing attendants. As for me, when I saw their evolutions, I was delighted with the admirable care they took not to hinder Protagoras at any moment by getting in front. But whenever the master turned about, and those with him, it was fine to see the orderly manner in which his train of listeners split up into two parties, on this side and on that, and wheeling around formed up again each time in his rare, most admirably. So there's a very... um symmetrical image there right of the way they're walking he walks one way and they follow him he turns around and they very symmetrically make a circle around and line up again and follow him some more and next did i mark as homer says hippias of ellis the next sophist he was seated high on a chair in the doorway opposite and sitting around him on benches were oryximachus son of acumenus and phaedrus of Meronius. Andron, son of Andrios, Androsion, and a number of strangers, fellow citizens of Hippias and some others. They seemed to be asking him a series of astronomical questions on nature and the heavenly bodies, while he, seated in his chair, was distinguishing and expounding to each in turn the subjects of their questions. Nay, more Tantalus also did I there behold which is uh, from, I think that's from the Odyssey. Yes, according to the footnote, it's from the Odyssey. For you know Prodicus of Chaos is in Athens too. He was in a certain apartment formerly used by Hipponicus as a strong room, but now cleared out by Callias to make more space for his numerous visitors and turned into a guest chamber. Well, Prodicus was still abed, wrapped up in sundry fleeces and rugs, and plenty of them too, it seemed. And near him on the beds, hard by, lay Pausanias from Ceramenes, and with Pausanias, a lad who was still quite young, of good birth and breeding, I should say, and at all events a very good-looking person. I fancied I heard his name was Agathon and I should not be surprised to find that he is Pausanias' favorite. And those two, by the way, remember, were in the symposium, along with Eryximachus and Phaedrus, who were mentioned a little bit earlier. So here we see that Socrates did not know Agathon. This was the first time he had seen him. And so that's why we can place this dialogue before the symposium. Okay, but uh, going on, besides this youth, there were the two Adimontuses, son of Kepis and Leo Colophides, and there seemed to be some others. The subjects of their conversation I was unable to gather from outside, despite my longing to hear Prodigus, for I regard the man as all wise and divine. But owing to the depth of his voice, the room was filled with a booming sound which made the talk indistinct. I'm going to pause there. So that's our setup. Before I say anything, I wonder what your thoughts are. Thank you for reading that. Um, <laughs> lots of names. It just seems like a very, <laughs> very busy uh, 
room or maybe couple mm -hmm. of rooms mm -hmm. and uh you know with a lot going on different conversations mm -hmm. um lots of key players and mm -hmm. the other dialogues so mm -hmm. yeah. anything you want to add to that jed oh all of those names i i, I bet they're mm. significant otherwise they wouldn't be mentioned mm. i'm wondering the ways in which they're significant. We've got people showing up in other dialogues. Um, mm -hmm. Him talking about how attractive Agathon is kind of makes sense when we remember that um, Alcibiades comes in drunk and he wants to sit next to Agathon and he, right. and he tries to like talk badly about Socrates uh, in front of Agathon. So he gets chosen by Agathon and tries to sit between them and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, uh, a lot of significance, um, standing in the doorway also, um, reminiscent of the symposium as mm -hmm. a, a theme, both in how Socrates acted standing in the doorway until he came to his, um, his insight or wisdom before going in. Um, only here he's standing in the doorway until he comes to resolution of the argument, mm -hmm. but not just in how he functioned, but it was also in the myth. Standing in doorways mm -hmm. seems to be a, a theme. Mm -hmm. um, the, the walking back and, th and forth um, reminds me of a lot of those people who are um, inspired talkers. Um, mm -hmm. I remember hearing a story about the great Alan Watts, how he would pace back and forth and people would stand there listening and waiting. And he would like he would like talk out loud and then suddenly he would come to an insight when he got into a flow, a flow state and, and everyone would be very like, uh, entertained by him. Um, mm. a lot going on. The two groups I think must be significant. Who are mm. these two groups? Mm -hmm. Are any of them Athenians? Are they Athenians and for foreigners or are they all foreigners? That's usually a significant in mm -hmm. platonic texts for some reason. Ah, uh, yeah, Charmides is a relative of Plato's in Glaucon. And uh, let me go to the beginning there. Callias also is a Athenian. So most of these are Athenians, and maybe there are some foreigners as well. And he mentioned that there are many, also many foreigners who followed him around from place to place, mostly strangers. So in when you see the word stranger, it means foreigner. Right. So I wonder what the significance of that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have these two groups, and they move in a very symmetrical way, so it's a very beautiful image. Also, I'm not quite sure the significance of the ranking of them. It seems like maybe it's not their wisdom that's being ranked, but maybe their ranking in society. Protagoras is standing and walking. The next guy, Hippias, is sitting, and he's sitting on a, on a chair that's high. He's seated high on a chair. And then the third guy... Prodicus is still laying down in bed. So you've got three levels. It, it doesn't seem to be the levels of their wisdom because he does mention down here the last thing I read. Oh, we haven't gotten that far yet. Um, I regard the man as all wise and divine. Prodicus. Although he was talking in a way that was indistinct, which makes it very curious. But certainly, um, Protagoras is socially the highest ranked. He's the highest paid sophist. Mentioned, I think, in some other dialogue, that he's a very high paid so um, sophist. So he's the highest social ranking. Who's running the show here, though? It seems like there's, there is some certain order in the way they're walking and whatever, but there's also a sort of a chaotic image overall. And I wonder who's running the show here? Um, who decides who comes in and who doesn't? Right, the eunuch and <laughs> the eunuch at the <laughs> front. <laughs> I'm not sure why Plato made it a eunuch, but I guess that's to take power from him, to show him as a someone who you normally wouldn't think of as being a person of power. Right. And maybe here somebody he is the one. Mm. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Maybe somebody who lacks the ability to 
give birth philosophically and therefore cannot distinguish between a philosopher and a sophist. Mm-hmm. Um, interesting yeah, that we were talking yeah. about getting our foot in the door mm-hmm. before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but also an interesting that the guy walking, you talked about the levels, the guy sitting on the mm-hmm. higher perch is mm-hmm. engaged with questions and answers and is addressing specific questions to him um, related to some field of knowledge, astronomy, I think yeah. it was. Astronomy, yes. And nature Whereas, and the heavenly bodies. Mm-hmm. Right. And the one on the lower level walking is giving speeches or something. To, he's not addressing anyone in specific, specifically and he has followers following him, which mm-hmm. is kind of a lower form of dialogue. And I'm, I'm guessing mm-hmm. the guy lo- laying in bed isn't doing either. Yeah, we can go back to him. Prodigus is here. Prodigus was still a bed wrapped up in sundry fleeces and rugs and plenty of them too, it seemed. And then that's where we saw Pausanias and Agathon were there. Um, The subjects of their conversation I was unable to gather from outside, despite my longing to hear Prodicus, for I regard the man as all wise and divine. But owing to the depth of his voice, the room was filled with a booming sound, which made the talk indistinct. So we don't know what they're talking about. So he was talking. Okay, so that theory Mm -hmm. of different levels of dialogue Mm -hmm. might not hold if if he's actually engaged in a good conversation. Mm. Unless the conversations were getting better as we went on. Interesting. Because he's the one who Socrates described as all wise and divine. Right. Maybe he can't hear him because of what Protagoras (laughs) is saying. Mm. Right. The most ignorant are the loudest. Yeah, so anyway, we can at least hold on to those sorts of questions and see how it unfolds as we go on. And so that is the setup, and now we can start the action here. And Socrates going on to the next paragraph. We had only just come in when close on our heels entered Alcibiades, the good-looking, as you call him, and I agree that he is, and Critias, son of Calescris, So when we had entered, after some little more delays over certain points, we had to examine, there it is again, that idea of them stopping and debating something. We went up to Protagoras, and I said, Protagoras, you see we have come to you, Hippocrates and I. And Jacob, do you mind reading Protagoras? Sure. Is it your wish? To converse with me alone, or in company with others? It is all the same to us. Let me first tell you our object in coming, then and then you must decide. Well, what is your object? My friend Hippocrates is a native of the city, a son of Apollodorus, and one of, the, one of a great and prosperous family. While his own natural powers seem to make him a match for anyone of his age, I fancy he is anxious to gain consideration in our city, and he believes he can best gain it by consorting with you. So now, it is for you to judge whether it will be fittest for you to converse on this matter privately with us alone or in the company with others. To write, Socrates, to be so thoughtful on my behalf. For when one goes as a stranger into great cities, and there tries to persuade the best of the young men to drop their other connections, either with their own folk or with foreigners, both old and young, and to join one's own circle, with the promise of improving them by this connection with oneself. Such a proceeding requires great caution, since very considerable jealousies are apt to ensue, to ensue, and numerous enmities and intrigues. Now, I tell you that sophistry is an ancient art, 
and those men of ancient times who practiced it, fearing the odium it involved, dis disguised it in a decent dress, sometimes of poetry, as in the case of Homer, Hesiod, and Simodius, sometimes of mythic rites and soothsayings, as did Orpheus, Mausius, <laughs> Mausius, and and their sex, and sometimes too I have observed of athletics, as with Icus of Tarentum, and another still living as great a sophist as any, Herodicus of Celimbria, originally of Mag Magara, and music was the disguise employed by your own Ag Agathiocles. <laughs> A great sophist. Pythocleides of Chaos, and many more. All these, as I say, from fear of ill will, made use of these arts as outer coverings. But I do not conform to the method of all these persons, since I believe they did not accomplish any of their designs. For the purpose of all this disguise could not escape the able men of affairs in each city. The multitude, of course, perceive practically nothing, but merely echo this or that pronouncement of their leaders. Now, to try to run away and to fail through being caught in the act shows sad folly in the mere attempt and must needs make people far more hostile, for they regard such a one, whatever else he may be, as a rogue. Hence, the road I have taken is one entirely opposite to theirs. I admit that I am a sophist and that I educate men, and I consider this precaution of admitting rather than denying the better of the two. There are others besides that I have mediated as to avoid under heaven any harm that may come of admitting that I am a sophist. And yet many long years have I now been in the profession, for many in total number are those that I have lived. Not one of you all, but in age I might be his father. Hence, it suits me by far the best in meeting your wishes to make my discourse on these matters in the presence of all who are in the house. Good. Thank you. That was rather long. Um, before I go on, though, I want to go back here and notice here that he calls sophistry an art. And we were talking before that Socrates called, he compared sophists to merchants, saying it's implying that it's not an art. And so we can already see some disagreement. Now, there are many people named here, Homer, Hesiod, Simonides, um, and some, athlete, um, some athletes like Icus, and, and then there are some that were called sophists. Now, they're all kind of bulked together here. Are they all sophists, though? I don't think so. I, he seems to like name drop all these guys and say like <laughs> they did sophistry wrong. I I know how to do it right though. Mm. Orpheus is in there yeah. as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like the yes, the great like prof in, inspired mm -hmm. prophet. How would you describe Orpheus? Yes, Orpheus and Musaeus have sex of mystery schools, so they're mystics. And perhaps and we can look at, sorry. Oh, perhaps mythological or something mythological. But they, there's, there may be some actual mystic who's inspired the myth, but Orpheus is built up as like a, a mythical character. Right, right. I've, I've only heard um, platonic philosophers talk highly of Orpheus mm -hmm. and even suggest that Plato was in a similar tradition. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. The Orphic Mysteries. Mm -hmm. Right. 
and we look to we can look to Homer and see evidence of um, mm-hmm. philosophical midwifery that Socrates himself practiced. Mm-hmm. So he's not a mere sophist. Neither of those two. Yeah, Homer and Hesiod were held up to the level of like the way we treat the Bible in our modern culture. Their writings were right up there as religious writings. Right. And so to bulk them with these sophists, yeah, rather humorous. And so he ends all of that saying, Hence it suits me by far the best in meeting your wishes to make my discourse on these matters in the presence of all who are in the house. And then the narrative goes on, On this, as I suspected that he wished to make a display before Prodicus and Hippias, and give himself airs on the personal attachment shown by our coming to him, I remarked, Then surely we must call Prodicus and Hippias and their followers to come and listen to us. By all means. Ah, read Callias. Then do you agree to our making a session of it so that we may sit at ease for our conversation? And the proposal was accepted, and all of us delighted at the prospect of listening to wise men, and took hold of the benches and couches ourselves and arranged them where Hippias was, since the benches were were there already. Meanwhile, Callias and Alcibiades came, bringing with them Prodigus, whom they had induced to rise from his couch, and Prodigus's circle also. When we had all taken our seats, Protagoras said, So now, Socrates, since these gentlemen are also present, be so good as to tell what you were mentioning to me a little while before on the young man's behalf. The same point, Protagoras, will serve me for a beginning as a moment ago in regard to the object of my visit. My friend Hippocrates finds himself desirous of joining your classes, and therefore he says he would be glad to know what result he will get from joining them. That is all the speech we have to make. Young man, you will gain this by coming to my classes, that on the day when you join them, you will go home a better man, and on the day after, it will be the same. Every day you will be constantly improved. You will constant sorry, you will constantly improve more and more. Protagoras, what you say is not at all surprising, but quite likely, since even you, though so old and so wise, would be made better if someone taught you what you happen not to know. But let me put it another way. Suppose Hippocrates here should change his desire all at once and become desirous of this young fellow's lessons who had just recently come to town, Zeuxippus of Heraclea, and should approach him as he now does you, and should hear the very same thing from him as from you. How on each day that he spent with him he would be made better and make constant progress. And suppose he were to question him on this and ask, In what shall I become better, as you say? And to what will my progress be? Zogippus's reply would be, To painting! And suppose he came to the lessons of Orthagoras the Theban, and heard the same thing from him as from you and then inquired of him for what he would be made better each day through attending his classes. The answer would be, for fluting. In the same way, you also must satisfy this youth and me on this point, and tell us for what Protagoras, and in what connection may my friend Hippocrates, on any day of attendance at the classes of Protagoras, will go away a better man, and on each of the succeeding days will be made 
I like events. Advance. You do right to ask that. While I am only too glad to answer those who ask the right question, for Hippocrates, if he comes to me, will not be treated as he would have been if he had joined the classes of an ordinary sophist. The generality of them maltreat the young, for when they have escaped from the arts, they bring them back against their will and force them into arts, teaching them arithmetic and astronomy and geometry and music. And here he glanced at Hippias. Whereas if he applies to me, he will learn precisely and solely that for which he has come. That learning consists of good judgment in his own affairs, showing how best to order his own home, and in the affairs of his city, showing how he may have most influence on public affairs, both in speech and in action. I wonder whether I follow what you are saying, for you appear to be speaking of the civic science and undertaking to make men good citizens. That, Socrates, is exactly the, the purport of what I profess. Good. Okay, let's stop there. Uh, we are out of time, but here we have then the setup of their discussion, right? So Socrates has kind of already set him up, you can see a little bit, right? How is he setting him up? Jacob, what are you seeing so far? Yeah, he uh, maybe answers very vaguely at first, you know, saying he, he will become better every day, consistently mm -hmm. become better. Mm -hmm. And Socrates says, you know, well, what specifically will he get mm -hmm. better at? Mm -hmm. And then maybe Protagoras puts himself into, the you know, answers becoming a better citizen, mm -hmm. which yeah. I'm sure Socrates will mm -hmm. pick mm -hmm. apart now. Mm -hmm. And what do you think of the idea of getting him to speak publicly? maybe he'll have to answer more honestly uh, in front of so many people. Mm. Or be more careful I, with his answers. Maybe he can't answer right. honestly. Yeah. Yeah, what are you saying, Jed? I love that. I, I, mm. I wish this happened in our world today. How cool would it be if... <laughs> Someone called out Elon Musk or um, or Jeff Bezos or even Biden or someone like that and said, let's sit around and have a chat about what you do and what you offer. And I mean, you've got a lot of power and a lot of money, each of these three people. Let's have a talk and let's do it in public. Oh, I would love to be there and sit around and where are those people? Um, I think Bernie Sanders had, you were saying, had a, um, a, a similar conversation with somebody recently calling out one of those um, medical um, price gouges. Ah, uh, yeah, there was a, a Senate hearing. Yeah, and he was questioning, was it the CEO of um, Moderna, I think it was, who yes. wants to raise the price of the corona vaccine. Yeah. Right. I'd love to see mm -hmm. someone with this level of skill being able to talk mm -hmm. to all of these people and all of the evangelists and others who, who act in this way. They, they offer something, they make vague um, mm -hmm. promises about making them better, and then they try and get them to, as he mm -hmm. said, um, disconnect from their family and make new connections with the group and all these sorts of things. I'd love well, to see it. Yeah. Yeah. If you're getting into a cult, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Has to be that. Yeah. I don't know that Protagoras does that, but I like that he's calling him out. Um, I find it interesting that he did set him up so he would be the one to decide to do it publicly. Publicly, mm -hmm. he's mm -hmm. not being um like forced, um, which is I think important. 
And I think mm-hmm. it is important that he have this conversation in front of others, um, not only because he would be forced to be more careful with his answers and more honest, but if show himself to all of those other people there who have gathered, then maybe those others might see who he really is and what he's really doing. Mm-hmm. And as such, they would be benefited mm-hmm. if they realize this guy is a fraud or doesn't know what he's talking about or is promising mm-hmm. something he can't deliver. Mm-hmm. And if if it is the case that these people can be benefited, then I wonder if we could conclude that Socrates is the one functioning with an art, um, seeing as he is benefiting not mm-hmm. just his friend, Hippocrates, mm-hmm. but also all the other people mm-hmm. there. Right. Yeah, there is a potential benefit for the people watching. And you can see that, like, I like how we can see inside Socrates' thoughts. And we see he's thinking, oh, I think this guy wants to show up the other two sophists. So then he says, hey, why don't we invite the other two over here? And that's like another setup, right? To get those two to come over. And then you see the competition between them. Oh, those two, they do things like they teach astronomy. Like that guy was talking, the great hippias was talking about astronomy when we at the opening there. Oh, that they introduce things like mathematics and astronomy, but I don't do that. I teach civics. And so you see like their competitions with each other and you can see those dynamics playing out as well as we go on. But by bringing those two in, it also brings all of their students and potential students. And so like you're saying, there is that possibility of somebody who's, even if they've already been compelled to learn through paying money, they may have an eye-opening experience of realizing that, hey, this young guy, because remember, this is an early dialogue, and so Socrates is relatively young, and yet if he can outwit or out-talk the most prominent sophist in the Greek world. What does that say about sophistry? Right. Good point. Mm. Yes. That was the meaning of that sidelong glance that he, that he Mm. shot to somebody as Mm. he was saying, Mm. as he was kind of like, well, they try and get you into these other things, these other Mm -hmm. subjects that aren't really important, Mm -hmm. which is really interesting because, um, Sorry to use this man as an example of a modern day equivalent, but recently Jordan Peterson has been making some press by saying we need to remove certain subjects from university, like mm-hmm. like uh, certain, usually the arts. We need to move mm-hmm. English literature. We need we need to remove women's studies and and racial studies and and like he went on a very long mm-hmm. tirade removing most subjects from the curriculum in a very similar way, mm-hmm. saying these competitors to my little cult that I've am developing and earning money from. Mm -hmm. Um, they're not, they're not, they're not any good universities these days. They're all woke and all that sort of thing. (laughs) So we do see these equivalents and, and we, and I'm also seeing a lot of young men imitating Mm -hmm. Peterson and Andrew Tate and these sort of people who have got a lot of popularity in the same category. But there are no, the, these like self-help hmm. gurus who actually do help people. I think right. They're not all Andrew hmm. Tates. They're yeah. not all like that. Hmm. But then I do see people imitating them, saying, hmm. "Don't go to school. They're not teaching you to be rich. Hmm. They're not teaching you to be happy. Join my course." Right. Even and it's kind of funny to see even like teenagers um, picking up this way of functioning that we're also seeing in our friend Protagoras here. Right. Right. Yeah, so we've already then laid the groundwork for quite a bit that's going on here. We have a lot to be looking for as we read on. And so then from next week, then we're going to get into the main subject that they're going to discuss. Okay, so that will... Can I, mm-hmm. can, can I like, improve? Like, I, I don't think I should leave it with Tate and uh, okay. Peterson. Okay. How about, how about like... um. Uh, the youth pastors and things who who have a lot more influence and they're seen to actually provide more benefit in society. Um, they go ahead and say, you know what, 
you don't need to go to university. They teach you about evolution. They teach you about these other things. You don't need those subjects. You just need what I offer. You just need the Bible and the way I preach it and that will make you happy and, and bring you closer to the divine. Okay. Yeah. I'm not familiar with those people so much, so I can't really comment, but it sounds like it could be. Yeah. And also those of you watching on YouTube, please put in the comments section who you think is a modern equivalent of Protagoras or these sophists that we're meeting here. That would be very really interesting to see. And so on that note, then we'll close it for today. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you'll join us next week. Salam. So